I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing, that it was all started by a mouse. Hello, everyone out there in podcast land. This is the Beyond the Mouse podcast, the podcast for all things Disney, for NPR Illinois Community Voices, and for the Front Row Network. I am your host, Craig, joined today by my co-host, Mr. Brett Rutherford. Hello there. And also Vanessa Ferguson. Hi, Craig. How are you guys doing today? What a wonderful day, really. Yeah. Yes, it's a really nice day. You know, we get, we get right now, um, as we're recording this, we're having a warm fall day and I'll take those as long as we can get them. An so. incredibly warm day after mm-hmm. a lot of cold days. So my allergies are through the roof today, but like you said, Brett, we got to take it where we can get it uh, because yeah. who knows what this uh, winter has coming for us. Winter is coming for sure, but that's a whole nother <laughs> show, right? Yeah. Today we get to have a really fun and special episode. So we have been, uh, much like the rest of the Disney community, just devastated to hear of the furloughs and also the layoffs happening within the Disney company. And so luckily there was a group of people that started a Facebook page called Ear For You. And I would definitely suggest that you go and check that out. So I'll say it again, Ear For You on Facebook. And it's a community of people getting together and helping those furloughs load and laid off cast members to uh, be able to promote their Etsy stores, promote the products that they're giving. Uh, If you're in the Orlando area, a lot of them are being, you know, let go from the service industries. And so they're doing things like baking pastries and delivering those to the parks for you. You know, there's a lot of ways that you can find to help give back to some of these cast members. And these would make great holiday gifts, whatever the case may be, whatever we can do to support these people going through an extremely challenging time. Um, There's also information on the cast member pantry on that page as well, which is trying to make sure that people that making sure that they can still have uh, what they need to survive and get through this time. So we certainly want to promote people going to that. Through that page, I was uh, going through and and kind of seeing all these amazing Etsy stores, everything that I could. And I came across this lady who posted, we are going to be doing a podcast. And I thought, oh my goodness, my podcast radar went up, right? And so then I started to look into it and it's a children's podcast, which I think is just an incredibly unique and wonderful idea. And it turns out that it's from two cast members at Disney World, and they are going to have uh, lots of different voices and lots of different characters and lots of different music styles. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is such a perfect podcast to try to reach out to and have come on the show. And so we're going to have Julie and Mike from Super Secret Hive on today. And I am so excited to get to talk to them because listening to their episodes, a couple of them are out now. You can find it wherever you find podcasts. Uh, Definitely check them out because they're so amazing. You could just tell that they have such an energy to them. So I'm so excited to talk to them today. I'm excited to find out kind of the story about how they developed this. And they are just incredibly talented people. And I can't wait to talk to them. Brett, you have any thoughts before we start the interview? Oh, well, when you were telling me about this and I got to go listen to the podcasts, it was it was a truly magical experience. And they and to to know that it's two people doing this is just amazing because all of the different voices are are so wonderful and just and the humor the humor i mean i i i love the humor and i like i i texted um vanessa i'm like you're gonna love this because it's it the humor's on so many levels i am not perhaps it's intended audience but i'm going to be a listener so anyway i can't wait to ask them questions about um about this podcast and their production you know because i always like to know about that and then also about their experiences as cast members so i can't wait to ask them all those questions yeah vanessa what are your thoughts going into this i'm kind of fangirling a little bit uh like brett said when he told me that it was funny i was like what it's funny like oh okay let me check this out and it really is very funny you don't have to be a kid to enjoy the humor it's really humor for the whole family there's jokes in there that um are just might go a little bit over a kid's head uh for example one of the jokes is uh 
the password is probably password because statistically <laughs> passwords are usually just the word password. And I la- I'm just walking my dog, listening to these podcasts, just laughing. I probably look like a crazy person because I'm just laughing so many times. I'll go, oh, that's clever. Oh, that's funny. Oh, that's so I really enjoyed it. I'm kind of just fangirly. I'm probably going to be asking them to do the characters like, uh, you know, do Polly Darton. OK, now do this one. OK, now do this character because I just love like Brett said, they're so good at doing different voices and different characters um, seamlessly that uh, it just keeps your attention the whole time. So I'm just so excited to talk to them. And I think we should just get right into it. So here is our interview with Julie and Mike from Super Secret Hive. Welcome to the Beyond the Mouse podcast, Julie and Mike from Kids Save the World, and more importantly, Super Secret High, the new podcast that has just been released, and we are so excited to have both of you here with us today. Thank you so much for having us. We're excited to be here. Very excited. Yeah. You know, I've been looking forward to this. Uh, We touched base, Julie, maybe about a week or so ago to set this up. And I've been so excited and looking forward to this conversation because it's not as often that we get to speak to other podcasters, first of all, Uh, but then also getting to listen to your show, which is now available on all podcast platforms. It is absolutely incredible. And we get to talk a lot about that today. But first, we wanted to start with a little bit about your backstory and how you got here. So we wanted to to know, how did you go about forming this partnership between the two of you? Did you meet as cast members uh, at Disney World? Or was it something else? Was it what kind of role has Disney played in sort of this partnership that you formed, and now bringing this podcast and also Kids Save the World to us all? Yeah, this is, this is a really fun story, Mike. Can I tell it from my perspective and then you you can, okay, awesome. So I was a musical theater and Disney lover from a very young age. And in middle school, I was auditioning for the high school show choir and word on the street was that there was this really young, hip, enthusiastic new chorus teacher. And he was just getting kids really excited about performing. So I met him I, at the audition, um, auditioned, got into the show choir. He had a love for Disney. I had a love for Disney. Um, and he was everything that everyone said he was. He's just so full of energy, took on so many extra projects, just made um, learning about music and musical theater so much fun. I would actually take summer school so that I could take extra classes during the school year with him. He's a phenomenal educator. So that surprise, surprise is Mike. So that's how we met. He was my chorus teacher. And then my senior year of high school, he actually said, you have to be singing this music, finding Nemo in a musical. It's like perfect for your voice. You've got to sing it. And we uh, went on the show choir trip every year to Disney And when we were there, there was a a Disney, but someone in Disney entertainment approached us, him and myself and said, hey, we saw her performing. We want to give her this little you've been discovered card. And so for me that the stars had aligned, I said to my parents, I've got to go. I have to work for Disney. So I ended up going down and going to school at UCF and I studied musical theater there and eventually auditioned for Disney and was able to do a bunch of shows. Nemo was my full-time role. And then at kind of the same time, Mike came down to Disney as well to begin his career there. So that's my perspective. I'd love to, I'd love to. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I think, um, you know, you meet so many people when you teach and I taught, um, choral music and musical theater for about 12 years in the kind of greater Washington DC area. So some at a children's theater up in, in Maryland and, just off and on different places, but I did have a full-time public school um, music educator role, and um, absolutely is correct that we we uh, we met during auditions, and she was one of those just super passionate people for the art form, for the creativity, for the collaboration, and and as you can hear from her her great set of pipes, that she has a cool sound to her voice as well. Just her normal speaking voice is, is really cool. And I think what's been neat about our podcast is to be able to kind of explore all the different ranges of our instruments, right, as we go through that. But um, I'll just 
mentioned a couple of roles that you had played in the high school sphere was like little Cosette from Les Mis. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then her senior year, we had a senior playing little orphan Annie, like that's how yeah, that perfect she could do that role. So when you hear <laughs> something like Nemo, which is a very specific type, you know, you need to have that perfect voice. You need to have that perfect energy. And she, you know, it was one of those things that it was a great, it was kind of a kismet that we, both happen to be there at the same time when this went through. So um, yeah, I think one of my goals with any student is to kind of just be passionate about what you love and hopefully it's music. Hopefully you have some of that for your entire life. But um, I think what we, you know, instill in others, we oftentimes forget to instill in ourselves. So I had this opportunity to, to, pick up and make a life change. And my wife and I came down to Disney uh, or down to Orlando with the goal of Disney. And um, truth be told, I had no uh, interviews. I had no job. It was just my love and hey, I need a challenge. Let's see what, let's see what we can do. So I had applied for uh, and eventually got um, a casting director role with the American Idol experience, if you remember that attraction. Um, rest in peace. But it was a, an ex exceptional opportunity to kind of take what we do as teachers and kind of squeeze the time limit, right? So instead of 180 days with the same students, you're seeing thousands of, of, of students a year that are trying to showcase how passionate they are about what they do. And they're in the sphere of Disney. So it's this even more infectious kind of place to be. So for us to have some of that crossover again in our lives, uh, both Julie and myself was super cool to see, you know, cause I could be just so, you know, proud in the audience and you know like how awesome she's bringing this Disney magic to everybody um, and then in my own way getting to do that and going on to even teach some uh, choral workshops for the Disney youth programs as well to it's, it's a part of me that will never leave but um, sometimes life and uh, other factors force you to be more creative about how you do it and and uh, hopefully push yourself to that to find that next next chapter so yeah and then that's that was the basic how we met. So we could keep talking forever because we've known each other that long. But <laughs> yes. that's wonderful. And you know, it's it's so cool that that story is so neat of you performing there, and then someone saying, "Hey, you really have this," and in giving you that, that's that's a wonderful wonderful way to get a start. And I cannot tell you, I have a, a young son. I cannot tell you how often we listen to Big Blue World and uh, how often we listen to the Finding Nemo musical. We're certainly going to ask a question about that a little bit later, but we want to dive into Kids Save World and uh, also to your podcast as well. And Vanessa has our first question there. Yeah. So Julie, it says on the Kids Save the World website that you traveled to several countries and around the U.S. performing. Uh, what was that experience like and, and how have those past experiences played into your decision to make a podcast for kids and families? Yeah, absolutely. So my husband is in the tech scene. So he was in Austin, Texas. I was in Orlando. Eventually we had to pick a city. So I made the the choice to leave, which was really tough. I left my full-time role as Nemo to join my husband out here in Austin, Texas. And I started a kids media production company um, now called Kids Save the World. We weren't really sure what to name it at first. So we had a very uncreative name. It was called Julie Frost Kids, but now we're Kids Save the World. And I actually was approached uh, by an organization working with the USO. They said, hey, we hear you're a military kid and you're a Disney singer. Would you be willing to go on tour for the USO and tell military kids about your story of reaching your dreams, even though as a military kid, you have some extra obstacles to overcome. And so I, at that point, I had never written a song. I had never written a show, but they were giving me this amazing opportunity. And so I took it and throughout this whole process, I was calling and emailing Mike, you know, will you listen to this song? Check out these lyrics. I truly had no idea what I was doing. And he continued to be a, a mentor to me uh, throughout the years as I went on this journey of learning how to write music and create shows and produce shows. So it started with the USO. I did a worldwide tour for that, which was really, really amazing. Not only do they send entertainers to support the troops overseas, they send entertainers to support uh, the kids of the troops overseas because a lot of families are sent and stationed overseas. So that was extremely meaningful for me as a military kid. And now my brother's in the military. So for me, I just have a ton of military connections. Um, that was very, very special. And then after that, 
I started branching out to other sponsor sponsorships and organizations that basically said, Hey, we have this really important message we want to communicate towards kids. We don't know how to do it. Can you help us come up with a way? So I partnered with Procter and Gamble and most recently HEB, which is the big uh, grocer here in Texas. So we do an anti-bullying show for them. And it has just been a, a whirlwind of a journey figuring out how to write these shows and achieve the goals of these sponsors in a way that's really impactful and meaningful to the kids. Um, and yeah, again, Mike has been a part of, I would probably almost all of these projects in one way or another, whether he's scoring for me or kind of like consulting with me over songwriting and uh, script writing and character development and all that. So he's been a major part in all of these projects. As he was full-time at Disney, he would do these um, side projects for me as well after hours. So it's been really, really fun to develop my career and also be able to work with Mike on a lot of these projects. And then of course, when we got furloughed from our, and our day jobs kind of went away, that gave us even more time to work together on cool stuff. So that kind of led us to working on this project full time that we'd always kind of dreamed about, oh, maybe we do a podcast. We always have these ideas in the back of our heads about these big dream projects we could do together if only we had the time and then, you know, care for what you wish for. <laughs> Right. You, you might just get the time. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> That's well, amazing. You know, yeah. I'm uh, sorry, Vanessa, I'm just a uh, butt in for a second. It, no, it's go cool ahead. to see that connection. I had no idea that uh, USO also brought people over for performing for the kids. And yeah. That's that's wonderful that that that's done. I always think about it as these big grand events uh, for all the soldiers, but the the kids. It's such an important part of that as well, especially with people stationed all over the world. That's really cool. And you know, um, I don't think that we have a question about this, but it's something I wanted to ask. Is uh, you are so good at the marketing of this. It, it, do you have um, some training in marketing or is this something that you've just kind of come to over time? How do you, you your press kit for this was <laughs> impeccable. It is such Thank a you. great way to put it all together. Thank you. Um, I have learned through running small, I have the small business of Julie Frost Kids or Kids Save the World. And then I also started another uh, random event, candle events company in Austin that did pretty well. So it, through those, you just learn so much when you start a business, you wear every hat and you have to learn really quickly. And if you're putting your hard earned savings towards advertising dollars on Facebook, you really pay attention to the data, what's working, what's not, you don't want to waste a dollar of your own, you know, your own money. And then I have also, I think kind of my secret weapon has been my husband and the tech side of things. He really has a great understanding of where you should be putting those marketing dollars. And there were several times he would step in in this process with Mike and I, where he'd say, no, you guys worked so hard on this. Let's make sure we've got a really good go-to-market strategy. Just um, so I, I really appreciate having him in my ear most times, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> you know, he's, been very, he's a wealth of knowledge and I do feel very lucky about that. But um, we also, we did hire someone for PR and she's been wonderful. So we, I've never done PR before. I've never been great about getting articles. Um, so she has just, she's a wealth of knowledge. She's in the kids music space, which is um, pretty new to both Mike and myself. And um, yeah, I'd love to plug her. Her name's Elizabeth Waldman Frazier. She's wonderful. If you need someone for PR in the kids' music space, she's just a, a real delight yes. to work with. And so she is definitely helping us as far as getting some awesome coverage. I mean, the day that I I reached out to you uh, through this Facebook group with uh, supporting furloughed Disney cast members, the uh, day that that happened, you were in Broadway World. You were on their site. And then I saw you in uh, a local community group in Texas. So you're covering kind of all these spectrums. So I, I envy that. That is great. But uh, Vanessa, I know you had uh, some questions for Mike as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, we also wanted to ask you about your experience as a music educator. Uh, obviously, it sounds like you were just wonderful. So we kind of want to know, like, what what tools and experience did you bring from education into this podcast? Because, you know, I'm an adult, but I learned a lot just from the music of this podcast. So, you know, there's that. Awesome. <laughs> That's great to hear. Yeah, the, the end goal for us was something that you know, if you've got the whole family in the car, that everybody would be okay listening to it. It would be something that, you know, when we, we did a couple test runs with some families, family friends that we know, and it was great to see, you know, even the teenager was like, I did not know that. Or 
I, I liked how that song went. And so that, you know, they were attracted to whatever aspect it was. We've been getting these fun videos from, from people that are sending like even their three-year-olds like dancing to, the, dancing to the song. And I was like, that is awesome because music is infectious and eventually they will understand all of the different levels of things that we're throwing out there. But we wanted it to be multi-level just to be inclusive of everybody, um, no matter what the background is. So we even tested on some super science kids that know everything, but they found uh, that they were attracted to the camaraderie of the characters and, and some of the creative avenues that we went like, oh, that's an interesting way to think about it. Like the we have a football game with a bunch of uh, worker bees to kind of create that analogy to what is it that these insects do so well? And it's because they're a team. But to your, to your question about the education, you know, I always felt that I had to be, if I'm, if I'm not honest about how I feel about a, an art form, a genre, or just creativity as a whole, students see right through that. They can tell instantly if you are not being um, authentic about it. And I, with my Disney nerdness and, and musical theater nerd, you know, everything I kind of gravitate to, I have to be, we won't use the word obsessive, but we'll say that it is it's just such a great world we live in that the technology has been able to take us places and let us hear and see things that we've never seen before. So that was part of my role as a, as a teacher that I remember my own music teacher doing, playing music that I'd be like, wait, who is this? Miles Davis? What, you know, as a, as a third grader or the Beatles I, with Eleanor Rigby is a, is a classic that I remember. And it's just like, wow, you know, if, if parents aren't playing certain types of music or you're, they're not listening to it on the radio or streaming services, then they can miss out, right? They can miss out on these opportunities. So as educators, we try to instill and, and make people exposed to all of these different genres so that they can find what makes them sing figuratively or, or realistically and, and go from there. I think one of the biggest things is when we did musical theater projects, you know, as lucky as, it, as fun as it was to do a production like Les Mis at the high school level, it's an interesting show to do for high schoolers because they have to pretend to relate to these things that are happening. And it's like, well, no one's been through the French Revolution. So there's the hard part, right? And then no one has kids and no one is in this situation. So it's kind of, you have to just play pretend and, and really connect to the music. And the music is what can help tell that story. Even if the, uh, the Victor Hugo element of it is not really something that makes a whole lot of sense to tell with you know high schoolers. Um, but I got to work at a children's theater that really kind of hit the point home and kind of inspired my approach to this project where we were doing these uh, shows where we would audition the kids and then we would write the show. And we would write the show after we got to know the kids. So what was, what was truly uh, concerns of theirs? What were things that got them excited? What were things that they were worried about in the future? Uh, could be in their current grade level, it could be in, in life. And we would construct a show around that so that the music and the script and the characters all spoke to those kids. Um, and I think that's what we really tried to do. Obviously, we're, we're no longer uh, child age, but again, it's the passion that we wanna really share with these people and, and try all different genres of music, but hopefully it's something that will speak to them on a basic level that after each episode, there are things that they can do right now to help make the world a better place. And some of them are so small or may seem so small, but they're really super impactful. Um, and I think the music had to be indicative of that as well. So we want to have all different music styles and we want the music to pump them up, make them know that it's okay to feel how they're feeling and then hopefully, you know, make them rise to the occasion when it's their time to, to make a choice, to make a decision and to live their life in the way that we hope all of us could do. Um, so absolutely, I think it's really, it's the passion of the music and, and the storytelling that you can do that helps bring people together. Um, and then you can tell your story. Yeah, yeah and, and talking about the impact of the, the episodes, I kid you not, I was walking my dog and I heard you say, you know, don't try not to use straws. And there was a straw on the ground and I was like, shouldn't be using that. I got it right here in my ear, it's telling me not to. So <laughs> I'm like, immediate, I got that lesson pretty quick. So, you know. Not, not quite your audience, can learn, but anybody if can I learn. can learn, anybody can learn. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're learning too. That's the best part. As we pick topics that we know kids are concerned about or that we know are affecting kids, um, you know, something simple as a honeybee, honeybees do so much for us. But a lot of times I remember when I was a kid, I was afraid of honeybees because I, you know, had... Full disclosure, I picked up, one was pollinating a flower and I thought it was a fly, so I picked it up and then it stung me. 
So yeah, so I learned my lesson quickly on that. But the idea was that <laughs> this is part of their world. So if they could take away just the idea that we can be still about around them, then that's great. And then the deeper level of like what you said with the plastics. Yeah, how can yeah. we help these these creatures, these wonderful creatures that are doing so much for us? Um, and that same goes with humans, right? These humans are doing great <laughs> things for us. How can we help the humans? Yeah. Right, exactly. I love it. My friends listening to this will think it's hilarious that I have uh, guests on that uh, interact at all with honeybees because I had an experience in kindergarten that has scarred me for life. So now I run away from bees like uh, like they're just be uh, still, there's Craig. something really wrong be with still. them. Don't but this is how I'm practicing be like therapy. It's like therapy for me uh, listening yes. to this. But, but Brett, you had questions specific to kind of the development of Super Secret Hive. Well, yes, actually, I, I'm not your target audience, but I, I um, I'm going to be listening every every week, and so because I learn so much, and and the humor is on so many wonderful levels. But I love all of your characters. I mean, Dame Judy Trench and Sir Ian Magellan. I mean, you know, I, I loved it, and your production values are so wonderful. I especially like. Um, the way you move the voices around in the listener's head to make real conversations because you have so many different characters. It, it's got to be so fun to create and challenging to edit. <laughs> but, but what is your production schedule like per episode? And, and I mean, totally musical episodes and you write your own music too. Is there anything you can't do? <laughs> well, Good questions. <laughs> was, Too many of them there, but well, hey, we, my turn. We, so. <laughs> we started this thing, um, full disclosure, we were hoping we could use, um, we had a, a great uh, sound engineer working with us and we're hoping to use his studio, but you know, we have, a, 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 our budget is zero. So we could not afford them once we continued. Um, so we realized very quickly, we were going to have to learn how to um, mix and master audio. So I started taking um, lessons and um, Mike does all of the scoring, any music you hear, Mike does every instrument, every, everything that is Mike. And then uh, he hands that over to me and I'll, I mix all of the voices and the, the singing and all of that fun stuff. So that has been a real steep learning curve. So I would say at first our timeline per episode was a bit longer as we were um, learning, the, you know, these new skill sets and we were trying to navigate the technologies of how do you put an episode like this together when you're recording a thousand miles away? Um, so that was a hurdle to overcome. Uh, there's a very cool, um, it's called, it's the Pro Tools cloud collaboration. It's a very cool concept where it's basically like a Google doc. You can have two people in, in it collaborating at the same time. It gets more difficult when you have a larger um, project and our sessions work very large. You know, sometimes we'd have a hundred characters. So it's just, tons going on. So the collaboration via the cloud got uh, pretty tricky for us to navigate. So we had to trouble, a lot of it was troubleshooting technology, learning these new skill sets. So I would say by the end, we got into a pretty good groove of, we had our schedules, you know, Monday we'd wake up, we'd, we'd brainstorm together. What, what could this episode be about? Um, Mike is the mastermind behind the humor. So if you are, if you're laughing at during the episode, you can thank Mike. Like he's just, oh, he's full of comedy. Guilty. Yeah. He's, <laughs> He's oh my so, gosh. So many he's times. So, he's so clever. clever. Oh yeah. He's gosh. so clever. And it just, you guys, and you only get to hear part of it, right? We, these brainstorm <laughs> documents, I'm just sitting there typing like, okay, Mike, just keep it coming. Like the, he just spews <laughs> off these ideas. Um, so we would start on a Monday kind of brainstorm um, and then start script writing, script writing. And by the end, we were pretty much done with our, our scripts by Tuesday or midday Wednesday. And then uh, depending on the week, Mike would maybe dive into, if he had a song idea, he'd dive into that. Um, we'd record, I'd start, I'd start doing all the mixing as far as all the voices and the timing and the sound effects and all that. He would be hard at work building uh, the song score. Then as soon as he was done with that, we would dive in and record the singing vocals. I would go back to editing that. He's, I mean, we, because it was just the two of us, we were wearing a lot of hats. So I don't think 
there was any episode that looked exactly like the last, but um, we did, we definitely got into a groove by the end where we were moving pretty quickly and pretty efficiently. And we, we wow. both have a problem with turning off work. So we would be like messaging each other at 2am, like, Hey, just upload it, you know? So we have a hard time turning it off, especially when we love what we're doing. So mm -hmm. it, it was, it was really fun uh, to kind of get in the groove of what would this look like if we were to make this full time and is this a possibility? Can we, will we ever sleep? <laughs> our, our <laughs> are like, <laughs> it is what? a treadmill when you yeah. commit to <laughs> this right. sort of thing. Exactly. Going over that production schedule, you, you formulate and, and can be recording one of these episodes kind of in a, a week time span. That um, is from that well, is incredible from conception to finished product it was more about like two weeks it was the, sure, the, the best we did but yeah that's, oh my god that's gosh. still just uh so i mean impressive. that i mean truly if um listeners to our show you you have to check out super secret hive and just it's astonishing just from the get-go the amount of editing that you can see that goes on and the original music and all these different styles of music. Um, Vanessa, I know you had a question about original songs as well. Yeah. Um, well, um, what I find really unique about the podcast, like we've been saying, is just the catchy and memorable and original music. Uh, so when you were planning out the podcast, is, is music something that you knew going into it that is what was going to set your podcast apart because it, it really is just so good. <laughs> and then uh, is there anything else that you, you wanted to really hone in on as making, you know, this is what our podcast is going to be. This is what makes us stand out. Yeah. I mean, and you can jump in anytime, Julie, but the, um, I think the idea that music was a foundation for this was, was the first thing we talked about. Um, everything we do that we've done together in the past has has been a music or musical theater kind of relationship and it's just a great way to to get kids to to be excited and and connect emotionally or comically or whatever it might be to the characters because there's there's that uh, hopefully a hook that you remember or a line or something that is like that's interesting to you um i think you know as disney aficionados that we all are you know, I, I think back to Lion King when I s first saw the trailer, I was um, old enough to have seen that in the theater, right? So when the trailer came and basically they just played Circle of Life and it was instantaneously, I know where we are. I know the excitement that I'm feeling, the chills up and down my spine. I know, I wanna know what this is all about. Lyrically, of course, it's just different ways of saying the Circle of Life in that song. So it's the idea, okay, we're gonna tell a true journey on that story. And for us, it was like, okay, we need to be true to these characters and we also need to have fun and, and keep challenging ourselves. So somebody like Polly Darton was one of our things. We, we, love, we love Dolly in real life, but the idea of what, what would happen if one of these bees was a little country, you know, you know, little bee of sunshine and, and what would that sound like? And then conversely, you know, when we meet Sir Ian and Dame Judy, they're going to be their their background score has got to be different than than Polly's. And then when we get to the Bowhead um, Club, where the Bowheads in the science world are known as jazz musicians, okay, let's get something jazzy in there. So it was kind of a cool thing to kind of go from episode to episode to talk about where we are. Um, next week we're we're putting out our the fourth episode, which is has a little bit of time travel, um, and it's on a one of those important Back to the Future days too. Not by accident, thank you know we're thankful that it was there, but. Um, yeah, to go back in time to tell a story, but how could we do that? So hopefully you'll enjoy our spin on that. Like we're going back to the age of dinosaurs, dinosaur music, what does that even mean? So we, we tried to make, uh, make it interesting for us and hopefully the listener as well. Well, that's one Can't of those wait. threads in, uh, yeah, one of those threads yeah. in children's musicals in particular. And I, I think my first experience with it must have been Joseph in the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, that idea that all these different types of music and they can kind of paint this broad picture for you of kind of creativity. Um, and so is that, is your goal then to kind of expose all these kids to maybe different types of music that they're not getting in their in their life is that something that you strive to do or is that just something oh, that yeah. it tends to happen i i think you know it's partially we have this wonderful you know, palette of colors that we can paint with right so some of that is how do we change our own instrument to create these different personality types different uh things so it's interesting to the listener no matter the age but i think the music is absolutely 
music is something that separates us from most animals on earth, right? It's something that, you know, what do we study of cultures that have, have passed? We get into their culture and, and music is such a big moment for that. We also are very in tune with the idea that, that not all kids like all genres. So the idea that if we went out and said, this is all going to be this one type of style, um, which is fine, because then it would be like, oh, this is more like Mike's style sounds like this. We tried to push against that to say, no, because heaven forbid somebody doesn't like a, the Polly Darton song, they'll have another song a few minutes later to kind of get them back into that and we won't lose them. And we'll also acknowledge that all of these, these genres are, are valid, have exciting things about them. And, and hopefully we do enough justice to the style of song that it's not, um, it's not offensive to anybody that truly loves the genre. So it's all done with, with heart and, and appreciation for those genres. And Joseph is the perfect example. I remember seeing that as a kid too, to be like, we went from country to Calypso to big Andrew Lloyd Webber, you know, ballad. Awesome. I, I grew up with Superstar, same thing. Like we took rock and roll to tell a story that you would never even think of rock and roll to be the, the you know, the conduit. So, yeah. Earlier today, by the way, someone posted this on Facebook and it has ruined my life now. Uh, they said, is anybody else going around and singing to the tune of those Canaan days, those COVID days? Mm. And now that's all I have in my head forever. So Thank you. I, I'm passing that along to all of you. Uh, so <laughs> thank so you. That. It would be it would be um, wonderful if this was just a podcast. That alone is such a Herculean task. Of what you're doing and what you're bringing to us, and the the uh, entertainment, the edutainment that you're providing, uh, much in the spirit of Disney, right? Uh, but you do so much more than that, Vanessa. You had a question about the um, other resources and things that are provided. Yeah, well, I was, you know, snooping around the website and I saw, oh, send my email, get additional. Yes, please. So for those who don't know, on the uh, Kids Save the World website, you can sign up uh, with your email to get additional resources. Um, and so I wanted to ask you about what those are and because I, I love the commitment to uh, engaging and entertaining, entertaining kids and families, even after they finish listening to the podcast. And um, who puts all those together? Do you have a team that helps you or, or, or are you doing this all by yourself? Mike, Mike is your team. We're, we're... <laughs> <laughs> We're, the good and the bad it's us so yeah. if, if you like wow. something about it it's us if you don't it's <laughs> the last. yeah makes it good for blame but um yeah I, I think we wanted to have you know part of it is like disney you know you if you visit a park or you see a, a movie it stays with you and we want the story to continue and for this it's so important that the listener finds ways to be active about whatever the topic is. Um, so whether it's the honeybees, we have uh, something about marine litter, um, things about friendship and, and loneliness, you know, whatever it might be, we want them to pick up and be able to continue it on. We also know that kids are staring at screens right now because of virtual learning and it's, it's, it's created a lot of new challenges for families in ways that they didn't, we never could have imagined we'd be at this point. So we wanted to create stuff that they could do some of it on their own, a lot of different age level activities. Some of them as simple as, as uh, uh, Julie had shared uh, one of the coloring sheets that we have of Polly Darton. But yeah, something as simple that every age, even adults love to color, you know, get, get into that Zen and bring anxiety down. And then other things that they're gonna learn new information about that episode through maybe decoding some secret riddles or through a, a word search or something like that so that they can continue on. I think our pride and joy is really, there's an activity every week that kind of pushes them, the listener into, okay, so what can you do now, right? When we, we as Julie and Mike in the show, we're put on the spot all the time. It's like, okay, so you've learned all these things, so what, right? So what's the point? And it's like, oh, well maybe, and it's those maybes those ideas that we want to just spark in those kids. So there's activities that's going to really kind of make them use higher level thinking to be like, okay, what we just heard, what, what's my purpose? What's my ability to, to help leave a legacy um, from what I heard? And again, even the simplest things can be, um, can be full of change in your community and your, in your world. You know, I, I, I have to just say too, it's uh, as someone that 
thoroughly enjoys podcasts. I listen to so many all of the time. It's really cool to have a show that I know I can share with my son because he knows that we record this and, and he's recorded a couple of things on the mic as well. Um, and he has his own little podcast that he puts together. It's very cute, but like, you know, I can't really show, like, I can't really listen. He can't listen to a lot of the shows I do and kind of experience that as a medium. And so this gives that opportunity. And not only that, but it reinforces with these resources. As a parent, I'm so grateful for that. And I can't wait to let him listen to this show and to uh, have that experience as well, because it's just going to be so great to be able to give that to him. Uh, and thank you for that. That's wonderful. So Brett, I know you had a question. I know. Since we're blue skying this, to use the Disney <laughs> term, you know, let's see. Do you have any secret hopes or plans for Super Secret Hive? I mean, I'm, I'm totally seeing this as a PBS series or Disney Plus, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. Is there an, listen, listen, all you professional people, this is wonderful material and you need to grab them up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that, Brett. Um, you know, I think at this point, we're kind of taking it one day at a time. We've had a lot of uh, big, you know, podcasts, publishers that are they're interested so we've had lots of there's a lot of interest there I don't know if any of those will play out um, of course those conversations get as excited because for us we just want to reach as many kids as possible so the thought is you know if we if we do have a partner or a sponsor um, then that's going to help us to make make an even bigger impact and for us that's really what matters um, so nothing planned as of yet but um, you know this the sky's the limit and if, if there's anyone out there listening who uh -huh. wants to have a conversation here at thehive.com. <laughs> That's awesome. Yay. <laughs> and to, to Craig's point about the sharing it with your kids, you know, it's the idea that the, the website is that continuation to say you're, you all are part of this, you know, the hive it's, it is super secret, but we want it to be something that, you know, you don't get a, You shouldn't get a badge for doing something awesome. You should, it's the feeling that you get from just doing it. Um, and I think, you know, if you could share that with your family, that's, that's even better. You know, um, it's, it's, that's, that's kind of been our hope and dream with this one step at a time here that we get that feedback from the kids that they're excited and that they took something from it so that we go, okay, great. As opposed to if it's, if we need to fine tune things, which we did along the, along the way, that's great too, because our audience is the audience. They, you know, you know, they know what they like and they know what they don't like. So we, we, our first couple episodes, we did a lot of revisions to, to find a place that we both we and our audience was happy. <laughs> yes. Wow, it worked so good. So good. So we are uh, beyond the mouse and we talk all things Disney. So yes. I've got some rapid fire Disney questions to bring it back to that. But first, this isn't Disney, but now uh, we're also all theater kids. And so I have to ask first, uh, favorite Broadway show? And these are all rapid fire for you. So I'll let Julie go first. Uh, but favorite Broadway show? Bright Star. Oh, so good. good Just was performed here locally in Springfield. It was wonderful. Really? Yeah. What a treat. Ugh. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I guess it wasn't just, I mean, this is, this year has been going on for 45 years, but <laughs> good point. I, think it was, I think it was 2019. <laughs> so. yeah. Yeah. Mike? Awesome. Uh, yeah, it was uh, Jesus Christ Superstar from the beginning of hearing the overture of that. You don't even have to listen to the whole show. If you hear the overture, you go, wait, we can do that. And it was one of those rule breaking kind of shows that uh, it's just a blast and some really amazing musicianship. You can't do that show with a okay cast, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's, Brett was involved in the production staff of Jesus Christ Superstar here. Here one, yeah, one time, yeah, <laughs> recently. Yeah, it was everything well, it's, is recent. It all seems now, recent. 20, it was, it, yeah, yeah, yes, and it's, it's a great show and you, and, and it works well. It works really best if you have a really, really, really good cast. And I, we, I was lucky to be a part of that group. So that was yeah. awesome. So they did it all post-apocalyptic. So it feels like it's very recent. That's been done a little bit, but it was very, it was very well done. Humbly, we say so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now back to the Disney questions, rapid fire. Julie can always go first, and then we'll follow up with Mike. Favorite Disney film can be animated or live action. The Little Mermaid. Mm. Oh, by the way, uh, we did talk to Jody Benson, and she said that her favorite show at Disney World 
is Finding Nemo, the musical. So she probably mm-hmm. saw you and, we and just made, loved you. We just completed that circle. That I was love great. It. The circle oh, yeah. of life. That's, how <laughs> cool is that? Very wow. cool, yeah. <laughs> but That's who doesn't wonderful. love Finding Nemo? You know, it'd yeah. be weird if she didn't love it. I'm biased, <laughs> but I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, what's your favorite? Uh, mine is The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which mm. is... Not one, it was a, during that great second golden age and, and Alan Menken and Stephen Schwartz together, you know, I saw you guys reviewed uh, Enchanted uh, recently and uh, it's, they, they're perfect together. I don't know why they don't work every project together. You know, I want them back and uh, the choral work in that and it's just such a emotional show. It's fantastic. And we, I even did a trip out to California many years ago when they did the La Jolla Playhouse. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, because I, absolutely had to see it and it just yes knocked my socks off yeah it's fantastic you know and we just uh a couple of episodes ago released a a villain's draft and we talked about claude frollo at the end he was he went undrafted because he was too evil all of us were like (laughs) he's too villainous i don't want to grab him (laughs) he's too much he's too much um all right favorite disney world attraction or Disneyland. Hello, it's both. You can well, be but either, you know so. they both work at Disney World. Come I on. know, but you know. <laughs> okay, I have to just say it. It's Finding Nemo the musical. <laughs> I, I am yeah. super biased, but I do. I am really passionate about that show. It's it's just a real. It's such a special experience that you get to do in a theme park. Which, for me, I remember seeing that show for the first time before I was in it, and just thinking, this is unreal that you can go to a theme park and see this amount of talent on a stage and I yeah I just love that story and I love that show I think it's really beautifully done I love the puppets yeah I think it's really beautiful in a world where we have fast passes again people you have to get the fast pass for Finding Nemo because the uh, the closer you sit uh it really makes such a huge difference in seeing those amazing the amazing puppetry that goes on and just the talent in that show holy moly it is a wonderful show for sure Mike what's your favorite attraction uh it would be the Haunted Mansion um, my dining room may or may not be a haunted mansion themed dining room. Just out there. <laughs> yes, um, that's awesome. And to to throw a a loving bone to Disneyland when they do the uh, Nightmare Before Christmas overlay, mm-hmm. it's like an entire new attraction. And and it is. Stuff. It's just unbelievable. So yes, I love the the mood. I love the music. I love Paul Frees's voice. Like all of the things that make that just iconic i love that it's not based on anything that it's just we created this it was going to be this weird walkthrough at one point i guess in the development and then the imagineers are writing grim grinning ghosts like it's just this wonderful collaboration that turned into something that it will live on forever absolutely always room for yes one more guest right yeah (laughs) (laughs) not to plug uh not to plug any conversations we have coming up but we are speaking to roly crump uh very very near future and so obviously uh very instrumental in that his vision of haunted mansion didn't necessarily come to pass but uh definitely something in haunted mansion lore to look forward to in that conversation um favorite place to eat at disney world where are you sending people Ooh. That's a good. This are we good sitting question. down? Is this quick serve? Yeah. Is this quick serve? I have my last have question. Uh, I'll, I'll give you oh, my it's... last question is going to be favorite snack. So as long as it's not a snack, as long <laughs> okay. as it's like a quick service <laughs> or, or a count, you know, sit down, whatever you want to do there. Um, I, I hope I'm getting this name right. The Flame Tree Barbecue in Animal Kingdom. Oh, oh yes. sir. I, it, well, yes. I mean, it was my favorite lunch so spot. Good. So <laughs> for me, that was my, cool. definitely my most frequented. How cool. I guess uh, so I didn't even like put two and two together there that you could like walk by Nemo in uh, Flame Tree Barbecue. And oh, be like, yeah. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm, totally. <laughs> yep. <Wow. laughs> I was there pretty often. <laughs> <laughs> I, bet. I bet. Mike? Um, I am going to say Sanaa which is over at the oh, sure. DVC um, part of the Animal Kingdom Lodge. And um, I have a, uh, I'm not allowed to eat gluten. That's, I've been punished and not, I have a uh, allergy to that. So they have the mystical bread service. If you've ever had that. Sure, yes. Bring uh-huh. all the um, uh, non bread and the like, mm-hmm. what, what is it like? 10 different dipping sauces. 27, like yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's 150 something. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, um, but they do a gluten-free non there. 
that does not look like gluten-free naan, but it tastes spectacular. So it's one of those places that it's a great place for just groups to meet, to hang out, take your time eating and try, try new cuisine. Absolutely. Love it. Oh, cool. Awesome. Oh, and the good. last rapid fire question, and this one has a bit of a history to it, but favorite snack? I love the Finding Nemo candy apples. <laughs> That's very oh. on brand and very awesome. That's a great answer. <laughs> So, oh, I just have, they're so good. They're any, oh, all the candy apples, but it's just, of course, the only one I would ever buy. So yeah. I can, I can oh. promise it, listeners that you will not be disappointed. <laughs> That's great. That is great. So the Nomad Lounge, if you know that in Animal Kingdom, is uh, right next to Pandora. They have a dessert that is um, these little mini churros with some dipping sauces that Ooh. spoilers they're gluten-free for everybody but um <laughs> oh, yeah right. they, it's own fryer so it's safe for me but it is it's got these wonderful dipping sauces that it's just it's unbelievable and it's bite sized so you can you know you're not carrying this giant churro or turkey leg down the street which is fun too but you know it's a nice place to hang out and it's just super yummy if you haven't had it how cool that yeah. is the that is the uh never ending debate on this show. I, I am very uh, Switzerland about this, but they, the, my two co-hosts have a uh, raging debate going on about turkey legs and whether or not they are a legitimate Disney World snack. So, uh, so we won't solve that today, but wonderful. <laughs> Thanks for asking all those uh, questions for us. Brett, I think you have uh, one more question related to the parks and all that for, for well, them. Yes, well, actually being a former cast member myself um and since you've had experiences with finding nemo the musical and then sam sins with oh yeah you know, oh sam. sam yeah yeah he so he taught me the show he yep he was the dance captain who taught me or yeah uh, dan dance captain so anyway, yeah definitely dance captain who taught me the show yeah a little shout out to yeah to those That's i awesome. worked with them in magic kingdom entertainment a oh. while ago so <laughs> oh my gosh so, awesome. but, yeah. but my awesome. question let's see what has your Finding Nemo experience been like? You know, um, I mean, it, you've, you've, you've expressed a little bit about how they kind of saw you and thought maybe you should audition and all this, but can you tell us just a little bit more about that? About yeah. your experience and yeah. audiences and all of yeah. those? It's, a, it's kind of a, a funny story. Looking back, I am a little shocked at my behavior, but I'm glad I did what I did. So I went to an audition when I was in college and it was at my audition was for the Hoop Dee Doo musical review. And so I got cast in that as Claire DeLune. Um, and that show is so much fun. And yeah, I'm a huge, huge fan of Hoop Dee Doo as well. Um, so that was the first show I learned. But um, at the time I was still a full-time student at UCF. So I, whenever I could, I would just come over and do shows. And after getting cast in that show, I uh, got a call from the casting director and said, would you come in and sing for us for Ariel and for Disney Junior? And I said, well, what I'd really like to do is be Nemo. And she said, okay, we're not casting for Nemo. And I, that, I'm not the casting director for that. And I said, I will only come and sing for these roles. If you, I'm telling you, you need, I need to sing these for you. Well, can we bring that casting director over? And so they agreed. He came over, but they felt very, I mean, it was not a normal thing. And I, I had such gumption, but I'm glad I did because I felt so strongly about, I'm t I have to play this role. I have to do it. I have to sing this for you. And so I did, I sang the callbacks for them and I was able to learn those shows. And then Six months later, I got a call. Hey, one of our Nemos is leaving to go do a cruise contract. Will you come do it full time? And so that, and so as I was graduating college, I just transitioned right into doing Nemo full time. It was really perfect. The stars aligned. The girl whose contract I took is now one of my best friends in life. And so it's just, but my experience at Nemo is, it's just a really, really amazing family there that cast um it's just such a special place to be and i feel so lucky that my first job out of college was i mean for me that was the dream job that was the goal i had a lot of peers in musical theater whose eyes were on new york but for me i'm telling you it was disney or bust i mean i just knew like i disney is home for me that was i knew from a really young age watching shows this is where i'm supposed to be this is my essence this is my voice like that i am made to be here and performing here so it felt just right uh to transition right out of school 
and go right into the role as Nemo. Um, and I, I just can't speak highly enough of the whole team there of performers. There are, I mean, there's so many Broadway vets there that, you know, we have all, all of the original guest dons and Phantom of the Operas and just, they joke that it's the Broadway retirement home. So to be this wide-eyed 22 year old going in, getting to work with these enormous talents, it was, it was unbelievable. So I feel just super lucky that that's, that was my first experience and that I've been able to maintain doing that role there. It's, it's been really, really special. That's, That's wonderful. And, yeah. you know, it's really funny. Um, we, around the time of the Hamilton release, we got to speak to uh, Julius Thomas III, and he had a very similar story where uh, he ended up being on the national tour of Hamilton as Alexander Hamilton. And now he he was recently in San Francisco as, as Alexander Hamilton. But he uh, had told them initially, he said, I am Aaron Burr. And if you won't listen to me for Aaron Burr, I won't. Uh, come back for Hamilton. And so it's a very similar story. And uh, it all worked out for him. He did play Burr a couple of times, but he uh, he admitted yeah. to us that he truly is Alexander Hamilton at heart. So uh, just a really fun, uh, That's that, it's good that you have that gumption. Like sometimes you just got to ask for it, right? Yeah. That's an important thing. Yeah. And Mike, what's your story? No, it was uh, American Idol experience. Oh, American that. Idol is what you did. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. Well, they're good. Yeah. Well, they need to bring it back because they own it, you know? I mean, like, yeah, isn't that ironic? <laughs> that is like what? It was like two years later, you know, and then they own it again. And and yeah, I mean, they, they own it, own it this time. They own yeah, it, own so. it, yeah. Yeah, yep. So amazing. What were some so. of your experiences with that? It was a just a really cool place to, because we had our casting, you know, every casting director was a little bit different, brought a little bit something from, you know, their past. So some of them had been casting directors for movies and TV in New York. Some of them had been performers, um, Broadway, uh, Disney, Disney Cruise, all of these things. So, and then some were more on the education side. So we really had a great combination that we could all continue to communicate during the audition process as we were looking for those next stars for not only the show um, on on property, but also the, you know, for the television show as well of who we could send with these golden tickets and all of these, all of these nice things that were part of it. But I think it was so cool. You know, there was an age limit to idol, which was part of its, I think, struggle in, on TV because the voice, you know, sustained it by not having that age limit as much, at least in, 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 the, in concept. I don't know how yeah, execution wise that, that, that they keep to that, but we still, you know, you're at Disney world, people are coming, uh, they're just, sometimes on vacation with their family. And then they're like, well, you know, I like to sing, let's see what happens. And then some of them ended up on a tour around the country because they were in the top 10. So it was like, you could make the dreams come true element of Disney was alive and well at that location. And then at the same time, it was a, a place where you had to say no more often than you said yes, which is a really interesting concept when you're talking about a place that people have paid to come to make memories that, that, that last a lifetime, right? You, you have anybody who's auditioned for something before has a little bit of scar tissue of, if it didn't go well, what do you do? Some people will just be like, well, I'll never do it again. And some people go, well, I learned something from that and I'm coming back. So we would see people come back every year on from, I was here last summer, we always come this week and I'm coming back and I'm gonna do this thing. So it was great to see that. And it was great to see kids that weren't age eligible for the show just come in and, and sing their heart out and and really get to know the types of music they're singing. You know, sometimes the singers that are popular are, are good for the singers. It helps healthy vocal production and sometimes not. So it became those little mini voice lessons to be like, I like the I like your energy. I like your enthusiasm, but let's work on a couple things here that you can come back or go audition at your local community theater or your high school court, whatever you're gonna do um, so that you've got, this was worth your time. And it was such a cool thing that they did. They took that risk. Mm -hmm. It's like Julie, you know, asking to audition for that role. These people are stepping out of their comfort zone of normally attractions come to you, right? Soren, we're going to take you to all these places around the world. You're not piloting that thing. But then as we get more interactive with Star Wars Galaxy's Edge and Millennium Falcon, like you are kind of more in control. So this is one of those first attractions where the guest was truly in control and the odds were not in their favor. So we had to make it one of those inspirational uh, places for them to come. And I think we, so many people, the return factor was so great with that, that we were super proud of everything that we were able to do there. 
That's really great. I uh, have a friend that uh, won one of the days uh, there awesome. and he speaks about that experience and how great it was to go through that whole process and how much fun that was. So that's wonderful. Well, it's been so amazing speaking to the two of you. It, you are truly uh, as kind as I would have expected you to be by listening to your podcast. So thank you so much for your time. I want to make sure that if there's any information that we didn't ask about that you wanted to get out to people that we let you do that. And then also for sure, plug where you can uh, find all of your shows, uh, but also the website for the resources and everything like that. Awesome. Well, thank you, Craig and Brett and Vanessa for having us. This has been, this is actually our first podcast interview. We've got quite a few lined up, but this was really an, um, an amazing first experience. So thank you for inviting us onto your show. And this is, it's been really, really fun for us. Um, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to do a little plug here. So for those of you who don't know about the podcast that we've just created, it is the super secret hive. It's an audio adventure series for the whole family um, the sweet spot is going to be ages 5 to 12, and then we also have a ton of free online activities that you can do at home. If you're a teacher listening, we hope this can be helpful to you as well um, with your students. And our big mission with this podcast is basically empowering kids uh, to learn how to take care of themselves, each other, and our planet. So we we feel really passionate about that, and we think that each and every kid is um so important and they have the ability to change the world and we that's why we are kid save the world not kids save the world we do really want to focus on the individual and individual responsibility but also just the amazing power that each person holds so that's uh, kind of my pitch but mike i'd love to hear what you have to say as well yeah i we want this to be as interactive as possible right they're going to come and listen and it's not a, a talking podcast you know we want to make sure that they know they're going to it's it's story time we're going to go on adventures and uh, but we want them to be part of that so uh like we said we had a couple of people that have been sending us videos or pictures of them doing the activities if they've planted a garden to attract some honeybee you know all of those sorts of things we want to see it in action and and really it's not just a one-time listening experience and you're done. It's something that you can hopefully take and, and really make that difference and feel awesome about it and, and share it. So, you know, Craig, as you listen with, with uh, your family and, and as everybody hopefully listens just for the fun of it, if you know people that you think would enjoy this type of journey and, and want to try out all these different types of musical tastes, you know, you know, everybody is welcome. We want to do this. We want this, this hive to be as big as we can make it. Um, because then think of the differences we could make together. It'd be awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, so if you have... love it, share, like, and subscribe. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. You'll we, see my um... like on Facebook. In fact, I think I was one of the first for your next, for next week's podcast. I was the first one to give the thumbs up for it. <laughs> and they're all ready. So. <laughs> And like Brett said, you know, even if you are uh, not in that age demo, you know, maybe out of it by a couple of years, you're going to enjoy this. So check out Super Secret Hive. But thank you so much. And so we clever. wish uh, the best to you all to you. I mean, I think this this truly is something you got something here that, big time. So. Hope that it hope that it gets picked up soon uh, because you certainly deserve it. You've put in a lot of work and it shows. Yes. Oh, yes. Well, thank you. We really appreciate you all having us on. This was a really wonderful well, <laughs> first good, experience. Good. Well, we can be your training Mike, wheels for this experience, you know. <laughs> oh. so, so well, if you ever want to come back and uh, it. do a deep it. dive on Nemo and anything ah. like that, you let us know. Gosh, that would be so fun. Thank well, thank you, you all. Best thank of luck you. with thank everything. You. Oh, you, right, you too. too. Thank you. That was fantastic. Those two are the exact people I thought that they would be because they're creative, they're so kind, they're so generous with their time, they love to give back. They, you can tell their passion for children in particular and giving their art and their creativity to the next generation, which I think is so absolutely vital. Um, and we talked a bit about the resources and things, but as a parent, I am so happy that this exists in the world and the work that they've put into it is just marvelous. And I, I love it. I love it all to pieces. Brett, thoughts about the interview? To find out that Mike does all of the music, I mean, writing it and scoring it and all of the instruments, you know, the way he said that 
you know, that if you like something, it's us. And if you don't like something, it's us. I'm like going, well, I love it all. So I'm like going so, so amazing. So yeah. So, and that production yeah. turnaround time, are you kidding me? Like she said, on average, two weeks to two weeks. turn around For these all episodes. That? All we do is yap With at the you. learning curve. And yeah, no. it, sometimes it takes slapping. longer than two weeks to figure out what we're asking, you know? <laughs> we got to step up our game, I think. <laughs> oh, please. We absolutely yes. need to step Let's, up our game. Yes, I'm like going, <laughs> yes, because the treadmill is lovely as it is. So let's just speed it up. So anyway. <laughs> Sorry. And with that, there's <laughs> another announcement. We're going to be doing, I'm kidding, because of how we brought on. Stop with your announcements, Five Greg. episodes a week, starting <laughs> tomorrow. Our, our little hearts can't take it. <laughs> I still swear that I told both of you that we were going to go weekly before I announced that to the audience. You and just, in fairness, you just look, at, the, you just look that at that video, we're going, oh, yeah, that'll be good. So. <laughs> <laughs> our, our improv skills though are on point you know, we just said yes like like, on point and yes. we're excited <laughs> are we excited <laughs> still That's are wonderful. still excited yeah you know, Vanessa, how, what are the, your thoughts yeah back to julie and mike wow they are wonderful i i just feel like they are instantly maybe not instantly but very very soon going to be going to you know huge fame and we're going to be able to say we knew them when they just <laughs> got started and and i have a feeling like families everywhere are going to know the name of this podcast because it, it truly is that good it is super high quality the music is wonderful the humor is wonderful the storytelling is just great and and did you notice too um that there's a little bit of walt disney ambition in there uh, when Julie said, oh, she didn't know how to do um, sound mixing. So she just learned how. Like, um, as soon as she said that, I was like, okay, Walt Disney. All <laughs> right. Someone's, someone's picking up on that Disney drive. So, yeah, I just thought they were wonderful. I love the product. I love the podcast. And uh, we are slackers. That was also my takeaway is, <laughs> wow, we we are, we are we doing enough? Game. I don't know. I don't know what we're doing anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Now we have a, a special treat for you. We are going to play for you uh, a bit uh, from Super Secret Hive, and uh, we'll have that right at the end of our episode. But before we do that, we have to give our sign off. So you can always find our podcast at nprillinois.org. You can also find us on social media, Beyond the Mouse podcast on Facebook. And then also you can find us at Beyond the Mouse pod on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening to us and be sure to hit that subscribe button and listen and tell all your friends about not only Super Secret Hive, but also Beyond the Mouse. It's, we got podcasts for you here left and right. We're also part of the Front Row Network. They have some great shows going on too. You can follow them on the Front Row Network, any different social media platform where you can find us. Whew, what a wonderful, wonderful day, wonderful episode. And I can't wait to listen to what they have coming up next. For Beyond the Mouse, I'm Craig. I'm Vanessa. And I'm Brett. And we will see you real soon in the front row. Maybe even sitting sort of by some bees. But we no, gotta be a still. A little bit away be from still. them. Be still. Be still. But that's but if we're sitting in the front row and the bee is around us, we could be still, right? Here at the hive. Super Secret Hive! We love to have fun and to feel alive. Our world is full of incredible things. Whoa. We want to see what tomorrow will bring. Let's go! Enjoy, Enjoy your adventure, so much that we can do. With so many questions, your help will see us through. Here at the Hive, we'll have no